So when I was here in April at the uh, Tourism Vancouver Island Conference, um, I uh, again had the opportunity to keynote. And my keynote uh, that day was called Adapt or Die. Um, I think it was the first time I used that particular title, which I then went on to use several times in many other places. I really liked it because it was meant to be slightly provocative. And then I thought, OK, I'm going to get in there, and we are going to provoke some change. We're going to get people excited and inspired. And what I didn't realize was that that provocation was, was already underway. Um, and we believe, I think, as, as an organization and as a, as a partner, as a collaborator with, with other organizations, that adaptation, especially for those that are leading the way in travel and tourism, is an opportunity not just to not die, which I think is a, a good goal, uh, but also to, to thrive. And for an in-destination tourism business, for a DMO, for the local community, and for the environments, I, I do believe that that is the goal, um, to make sure that, uh, that the future is, is full of thriving and, and not just avoidance of, you know, avoidance of death and, and of crisis. I think it's hard not to ground ourselves in the, the stuff that's going on in society, um, the big, big issues, and there are big issues happening all around us. And we're not insulated from those as individuals, as humans. People ask me all the time, how do you work on climate change all the time and not go into a corner and cry at the end of the day? And I do that, <laughs> but, I, but I bounce back every day. Um, but as a human, as a father, um, as, a, uh, as a professional that cares quite a lot about the industry that I, that I work in, the people that I work with, um, and travel as a, as a core thing that, that I love to do and that we all love to do, the exchanges that we get to have and the, the way that we've in some ways taken for granted the fact that you can just move around the world as you like um, for the most part and, and visit places. And COVID really shook me up. You know, I was living in England at the time and away from our, uh, I was with my wife and kids, but away from our family, my the grandparents, all that. And it really struck me that those first months that we couldn't leave. Um, and being away from family at a time where we, we wanted so desperately to see them was a, was a moment where, I, where I, I really realized how much I'd taken that for granted in my life. Um, so these are things that I, I believe that we're all fighting to protect. It's not just climate change, I think the perhaps and the, uh, in some ways the, the equal number one crisis is the, the equity crisis, the deepening inequity in our economy, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, which, which is not something that is new, but is something that has come to the forefront in ways that we're all uh, much more aware of, much more able to, I think, um, have conversations about. But it goes beyond into, into uh, the workforce crisis, into the affordable housing crisis. These, these topics are all, are all linked. And they're not so unlinked from the triple planetary crisis, um, which increasingly, uh, you know, although the focus for rightly in many ways is on climate change, if you haven't heard the triple planetary crisis, this is something the UN uh, refers to as um, the crisis around biodiversity, um, plastics in the ocean, and, and climate change, which are, of course, all linked but, but separate issues at the same time, requiring their own frameworks for change. So what role will tourism play in, this, in these stories? I, I think that in many ways is up to us. And there's a, uh, been a lot of discussion in my world around this phrase, tourism is a force for good, which Vancouver Island, 4VI, has, has uh, chosen as its mission statement that, that uh, tourism will be a force for good on Vancouver Island forever. UNWTO and the WTTC and other big you know, big name organizations in travel and tourism have been advancing this idea of travel and tourism as a force for good for quite a while. And I, I've said these words many times in my own presentations and my own conversations within the industry. And I realized about a, I don't know, a year ago, two years ago, that I wasn't sure anymore. And not that I didn't believe that it was possible. If I didn't believe it was possible, I would not be standing here. I do believe it's possible, and I do believe that tourism has a really important role to play, but I don't believe that that role um, hap just happens by default because we show up, um, that tourism exists, that therefore it is good. Um, and I think there must be more intentionality around tourism on Vancouver Island, around tourism anywhere, um, to, uh, to make sure that we are the, the force that is driving tourism to be a force for good. And that's uh, on us as, as individuals and organizations playing an active role in this process.
I think this question, what role will tourism play, mirrors a question that many communities are asking, which is why do we want tourism? I think it's a fair question, and I think it doesn't automatically, it shouldn't automatically make us defensive that they don't want it. I think it's a fair question to ask what they might want out of it, <laughs> what, what tourism might help them to achieve as a community, and the more tourism positions itself within this broad conversation, the more likely we are to, um, to be able to demonstrate that outcome. So two weeks ago, um, in, uh, in Bloomberg News, we had a, uh, an, a great story, um, also by Lily, um, who, who Brian talked to. Uh, we spent many, many hours on the phone with Lily preparing for this story. Um, so we, at the Travel Foundation, uh, were, the, were co author of the Glasgow Declaration. I had the great privilege to work on that committee and, and be a part of creating this, um, um, this flagship initiative for the UNWTO and, and now the Travel Foundation as we're um, the coordinating partner for the declaration. And we have been working on this, uh, this initiative daily um, for a couple of years, but with a um, lingering question in the back of our minds. So the Glasgow Declaration is, uh, as, um, as Callum introduced, a global commitment to half emissions by 2030 and reach net zero as soon as possible by 2050. That doesn't mean that every single organization necessarily needs to achieve that same target. It is that we think for the first time, the spirit of the, of the initiative and of the declaration is that we have to work together and find a way as a complex, fragmented, um, but very powerful and very important industry on this planet to attack this problem that is bigger than any of us because no individual entity, even the biggest ones in, in our industry, can have enough of an impact on, on these targets, which by the way, were, are the same targets in the Paris Agreement and that science has been telling us for a while that we have to do um, to uh, try to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees. And then if, if you listen to the conversations at the most recent COP event in Egypt, most people have already moved on from 1.5 degrees. Does that mean that we need to abandon the goal? I, I don't think so. To me, what it tells me is we need to continue to throw everything that we have at it. But this lingering question that was in the back of our minds while we put out this declaration and said we should all work together and collaborate and that would be great, is how? How would we do that? <laughs> what exactly would that look like? Is there a formula for, and, and it's hard working at the global level and trying to figure out all these pieces and how they might fit together. Um, but we wanted to try to figure out if there were any answers, if there were any recipes um, that would at least point the way and, and give us uh, some contours of how what we need to prioritize, what needs to be resourced, um, what guidance we can give to you as, again, as businesses, as, as DMOs, as destinations, on, on what, should be, um, what, what should be the focus in a time of limited resources. We were able to find uh, a, an amazing partner in um, Dr. Paul Peters, um, who is an academic in the Netherlands, who's actually been um, trying to answer this question for quite a long time. And he created a simulator. It's actually something that he's been working on for the last 10 years. And it's pretty cool, it's like a video game. You can, yeah, we actually went to Rotterdam and like played with this simulator all day long. And the goal at the heart of this research was very simply, um, is are there any scenarios um, that include uh, business as usual, travel and tourism, meaning projected growth um, all over the board, um, over the next um, uh, decade as well as into 2050 that are in any way compatible with achieving these targets. We just wanted to know um, what's the compatibility of, of growth and if there is any compatibility, what are the key elements? So we found um, some disheartening news, some potentially hopeful news. It really depends how you look at it. And what was really interesting in doing a lot of engagement around this research and the findings is that it became a bit of a Rorschach test. Whoever I showed it to came back with a different response, which was really surprising. Some people were like, well, this is great. We have a scenario. Some people said, oh, we, this just makes me want to cry. We have to give up. Things are horrible. It's really hard. I'll tell you where I landed in a minute. But the, the results of the research were such that the 2030 target um, was, uh, was not aligned in any way with um, traditional, uh, traditional uh, trajectory of growth. 2050, we did find a scenario. Um, and that scenario involves a lot of things, and I've tried to outline just the, the highlights here. Um, uh, basically, electrification of everything that can be electrified. Um, we did not use fantastical technology scenarios in this. So yes, there are still variables that we don't understand, and 
you can't map those scenarios for you'll just be in the room forever. So um, there there are um, and there are some limitations. It's not a perfect study, but again, it's it's designed to provoke and, and have thoughtful dialogue around this conversation. So electrification efficiency of, of essentially everything eventually getting to flights when we can. Um, it, it is pretty clear that the there is a pathway eventually to get um, airlines there, but it's not fast enough. Um, shifts in modality, so people traveling in different ways than they have previously. In places like North America, for example, where people fly around a lot. I know this is harder for, for you on Vancouver Island, but in places where rail infrastructure might make a big difference, advocating for, you know, for better rail infrastructure. Um, with significant, I mean, significant investment, though, to get that infrastructure up to speed. Um, 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 this is the biggie, <laughs> slower growth in aviation, um, particularly in long haul travel. And interestingly, again, even when I bring this up, there's a little bit of teetering around. And, and, um, and we didn't even say here that aviation had to shrink <laughs> or anything like that. We just said that the growth um, in this particular scenario, that if we slowed down the growth of long haul travel, and um, we got people, so basically uh, trying to reduce the most polluting and, and hardest to decarbonize flights. People tend to actually think that the short haul flights are the problem. Um, th this research actually does not uh, believe that short haul flights are the problem. It doesn't mean that just go fly wherever every weekend, um, but that in the model, the long haul flights are the most um, difficult to, to uh, reduce emissions around. And most, maybe, Cool, in a cool way, I think, and, and, and aligned with how many people in this room think, but focusing on optimizing the visitor experience, getting people to stay longer, getting more value um, from a sort of uh, uh, experience per emission, <laughs> um, you know, if we want to use that indicator, on, on uh, people's trips, and then getting people to you know, uh, uh, connect places. Um, if they are going to go on a big trip a year, make it more complex, stay longer, multi-destination, and, 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 and do it, um, avoiding the sort of flights, um, flights in the middle. So yeah, so we found this research, uh, we found this model for 2050, and it is one scenario that actually would allow us to more or less grow. There are lots of other scenarios which involve much more uh, pain points. Um, you know, significant uh, 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 cuts in growth. Um, big, big taxation, you know, big, big um, uh, challenges for consumers because prices are going to get really high. Um, and I don't actually think it's worth debating. Um, I, I think that at the end of the day, um, getting stuck into the scenarios and the numbers and the wall well, fun probably for some people, and I know my team really had a blast, and, and some people go right there, all the details. I think th that actually what we need to take away from this is that the scenarios um, for maintaining business as usual are, are wildly unrealistic. Um, and all that means is that we need to be prepared for change. And I think that means we already know we need to be prepared to adapt when it comes to things like, um, like weather patterns, which are shifting. Um, but I think we have to be prepared for changes to, to, to growth, you know, to growth patterns that we may not understand. And thinking about COVID, where all of a sudden many people were thrown into a, a sudden disarray by a, 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 a shift in, in what? Visitor flows and visitor patterns in many places. Some places were more crowded than ever. Some places had no tourism anymore. And it was a big shock to the system. We are um, still in time to innovate and to adapt and thrive. And that's potentially the hopeful message coming out of this is that if we, if we were indeed to mobilize and really think about how to prepare to build in um, resilience to this vulnerability, to the potential future shocks, to the fact there may be future pandemics, there may be, you know, certainly we, are, we already know that regardless of what we do, climate change impact is here to stay for a while. So do we have the will to adapt? Will we take the responsibility for um, including CO2 emissions in the way that we market places. Some places are starting to do this. Will the investment be made? Is travel and tourism capable of mobilizing this kind? And again, I'm talking globally, but I think the issues they do tend to extrapolate in some ways. But at the level of, of, a, of a, you know, trillions, um, is, is it would be required to make that investment around infrastructure and all the other sort of shift to a new model that would be required. But when you look at it, actually, and you look at the sort of growth projections that come out of WTTC at the same time, you realize that's only 2.2 to 3% of 
all of travel and tourism revenue that is expected. So then it becomes, it feels to me like not such a hard challenge in some ways, yet we've never been able to pull off such an investment. Will we collaborate enough? Um, again, the challenges, like everyone has said, and to me it is the theme of, 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 of everything that I, I'm doing now, are we able to unite around macro change or will we all stay in our lane and have a, a little impact and possibly greenwash our way into the future? Or will we solve the problems? We have to solve the problems together, they're too big. Will we be fair and equitable? So imagine, I'm trying, I was trying to imagine a scenario where we, we knew as a global travel and tourism industry that we had to cut you know, 10% of flights in the next year and, and we had to figure out how to do that. And how would that happen? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't know exactly, but my, my uh, guess is that whatever happened would probably exacerbate existing inequities and would not necessarily go to the heart of the problem. But you do have island nations, for example, in, in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, that without tourism, there isn't much else. Um, and and, and you know, the conversation at the last COP was around loss and damage and so sort of what does that look like? And I, I think it's an important conversation to have in tourism. How do we contribute to that? But it, it takes, it also um, affects vulnerable populations everywhere. Um, populations that, um, you know, even if you think about small businesses, which are primarily owned by, by women um, and by minority groups, that oftentimes they are the first to go in a crisis. They are the ones that have not enough resilience and not enough of a, of a cushion built in. What will happen there? Um, when, when those businesses are, are the first to, leave, leave, um, to be left out. Again, I'm trying to be hopeful in the fact that if we are, if we are proactive and we understand the, that, the, that these issues are mo the most likely to occur, can we mobilize in a creative way to, um, to address them ahead of time? And will we be offering um, actual trips, you know, experiences, um, um, entire itineraries that are uh, properly and effectively labeled so that consumers can make better choices by the end of this decade? This is a dramatic slide. I didn't <laughs> smoke and everything, but business as usual is, is not an option, but um, I, I don't believe that just means we pack it up. <laughs> you know, I, I think that, that to me, and hopefully you hear the same, is a call for innovation and a call for creativity. And, and crisis tends to breed the best of that. <clears throat> I do believe that at the, the, the end of the day, this comes back to destinations. Um, I like this phrase, destinations are everyone's business. The, the word destination and the word DMO tend to get kind of conflated, but here I'm talking about destinations as, you know, as a system. Um, and, and it is everyone's business to, to come together, destination management organizations, alongside stakeholders um, to answer the call and adapt to the new or now many areas of focus that are in a, in a changing world with a changing mandate. In many cases, we saw this happen during COVID. DMOs adapted quite quickly in some places and became something new. Um, we're working in places that are, are coming up with quite radical ways of working. Radical sounds, um, I don't know, not just radical, but I mean, really thinking this is not working. We must come together and we have to break some of the habits that we've built. So I wonder if, a, if similar approaches will actually help us um, fight against these crises. It's with that that I want to introduce the Travel Foundation. The Travel Foundation has been a leading nonprofit in the world of travel and tourism for 20 years. Our 20th anniversary will be next year. Um, and our focus has always been about um, helping to ensure that tourism has, brings out about a positive net benefit to destinations, ultimately communities and the environments that they depend on are our, our main stakeholder. But we're an industry organization. We were funded by the industry for a really long time. But particularly in the UK, large tour operators who were quite powerful. Um, we're putting money into the Travel Foundation. That's why we're actually called the Travel Foundation. It was actually set up as a foundation, a grant-making organization that was taking this money from UK operators and looking at the impact that tourism was having on places and designing cute projects that made everyone look good. And, and in some cases, we, you know, we, we really did a great job, but it was, it was a lot of tinkering around the edges and not really getting to the heart of the matter. Thank you the heart of the matter um, as to um, why these places, places were repeatedly having, facing challenges. And then the last decade happened where the challenges grew in ways that really outpaced the um, you know, communities and, and, and DMOs, in many cases, ability to actually um, 
to actually deal with with some of that impact. And this led to the change, you know, the call for um, changes in destination management, calls for less volume and more value. But what does that value actually look like? And there's more nuance than just let's bring less people and get them to spend more money. Um, it's and 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 we. Um, have been working at sort of this at this place, um, really trying to trying to lead in many in many ways a, a call for change, um, and a call for the way that that places are managed, um, and we also see ourselves as a support for those places. We're not the ones to go in and, and make the change. I think at, in the old days we might have thought that was true that there was a need for us to parachute in or our partners to parachute in and, and, and bring solutions, but there's no way that those solutions should be designed by anyone but the people who are sitting in this room um, who are a part of this place. And um, we have increasingly just tried to position ourselves as an organization that partners with the industry, partners with destinations, but ultimately with a with GMOs, but ultimately as a, uh, as a, as a way to, um, to achieve the, the, the mission that, that we've outlined here. Um, we have set up our priorities um, as as equity and, and climate change. I don't see that these two are are necessarily separate issues. I think they are quite inextricably linked. Um, but we separate them because I think as part of a narrative and as, you know for people to understand a bit more about what what it is that we're focused on and and how that taps into the concerns of communities and of society, um, we, we've decided to define them that way. When we define equity, there are a lot of organizations working on equity in lots of different ways. Our focus, our sort of entry point, is um, equitable distribution of benefits um, from tourism to communities. To, so looking at um, uh, making sure that, that uh, leakage is, is reduced and that um, revenues are, are spread in a fair way, reaching, reaching vulnerable populations, that sort of thing. And also, we, we talk a lot, and I, I don't see many organizations talking about equitable sort of use of resources. So. Um, resources that are shared between, or assets that are shared between um, the, the visitors and the residents of a, of a community. Um, infrastructure, water, um, you know, uh, waste services. And we were the organization that um, uh, developed a report in 2019. <laughs> the years really blend together some way. 2019 with Cornell University and Eplerwood International, which is called The Invisible Burden of Tourism. And that was our attempt to bring some of these issues to the surface, that, that um, uh, tourism was not always necessarily paying its way. And again, this is not meant to be a, a, an attack on tourism. We, we believe that tourism brings great things to places, but that it, it needs to be really balanced in, in order to not cannibalize some of those benefits. And some of the burdens were starting to feel a little bit unclear. Like there, there was a feeling that, that places were stretched a bit um, from a resource perspective, from a um, sense of place perspective. Um, but here we propose that there's actually a model trying to understand um, exactly what, what it is that, that, that uh, what are the costs that um, uh, communities are bearing when it comes to tourism, who is responsible, and, and looking at who's responsible for those costs and how do we make sure those costs are well accounted for so you can end up with a net positive. Um, and that report was quite a um, was quite a landmark report for us at least. I mean, we hear all the time that people have used this report that's really um, uh, advance their thinking as a nonprofit doing advocacy. There's nothing more that we could hope for than people sort of telling us that they read it <laughs> and that they, it, you know, it somehow influenced them. Um, one organization in Chile actually told us they were using it as their Bible for their work going forward. So that was, you know, that's great. And, and there are tremendous things happening in civil society all the time, particularly from academia, that do get lost. Um, some of it definitely not practical enough. Um, some of it just can't be practical enough until it's piloted or until it's brought into that environment. But um, this was a real win, taking some, some amazing thoughts from some brilliant minds and, and really trying to translate them into, into a, a path forward that the industry could understand. Then six months after The Invisible Burden came out, we were on this big speaking tour about The Invisible Burden, excitement, um, and, and COVID happened. Um, and in the early days of COVID, one of the first things that journalists like to ask me was, so does the invisible burden still matter now? <laughs> you know, now that there's no people and this sort of thing. And, I, and to me, it had never been more clear actually why it mattered. And, and it's because you would see 
all of a sudden, places that had not been expecting visitors were suddenly getting them. I think about my part, I lived in the UK, I was living in Bristol, and there was this beautiful park across the street, which suddenly became used 10 times the amount than it had been used the previous year. But of course the budget, and we all went through this, right? Places were dirtier than you expected, and like the infrastructure just wasn't there to deal with people being outdoors. So that's, to me, the invisible burden. And it's not that we're not capable of dealing with it, it's that the cycles of planning and the data and the information need to keep up with the, the, the increase in demand in order to understand how to solve the problem. But if we're talking two different languages or planning around two different scenarios, then it's hard to actually tackle the problem. Um, Several, uh, just a few months actually into the um, pandemic, we also launched the Future of Tourism Coalition. Um, we are uh, an organization that defined ourselves from the, the first day of my tenure there as being uh, highly collaborative. And I know it's easy to use that word. It's easy to throw it around and say, let's collaborate. And people, I think we were joking about this uh, last night at dinner. I get emails a lot of times from people saying, let's collaborate. <laughs> about what? You know, I mean, um, really thoughtful collaboration takes trust building. It takes um, learning about one another. And it takes finding alignment before you even find the ways to be transactional. Um, and. I thought it was really important that we first and foremost align with the other nonprofits in, in our space because it was really confusing even to us what we all did and why we existed. <laughs> I left my previous nonprofit where, because I woke up one night in the middle of the night and didn't believe in it anymore. Not that I didn't believe in the mission, but I wasn't sure anymore about our ability to steward the funds that we had been given to make change. And I think these were some of the barriers. We just didn't know exactly what we were doing, why we mattered, and what it is that we were trying to change, and how that fit in with others around us, because we're all small. And you could all take that example and, and think about your own organization or your own, you know, your own work and think, yeah, I can do this, but what, how does it fit with the rest of the system? You can use that in a way that excuses your, your responsibility, or you could use it as a way to catalyze your responsibility. So we decided to take the step of trying to catalyze and trying to build more of a movement. And I always said, even if all we did at the end of the day was have a un more united voice for those of us who care about um, creating a different future for this industry, that at least we'd be saying it in the same way, more or less. <laughs> and having that united voice was, was a, I, I think, was really meaningful because even, even cannibalizing our, our own voices was, was really creating problems. So we, we developed these 13 guiding principles for the future of tourism and, and launched the Future of Tourism Coalition. Th this was the time where we were all talking about building back better and, and those platitudes that were being thrown around every day. And I hated the platitudes, I really did, because I just thought they were empty. Um, it's easy to talk about building back better, it's not easy to underline better and say, what do you mean? What does better actually look like? So we decided to put some meat on those bones and, and, and you know, this is still, this is not enough, but it is a framework that outlined um, 13 principles that we thought brought it all together without trying to be perfect about it. And, um, and we started to just put it out there and allow, and allow people to become signatory to the coalition. And people started to say, oh, well, what if they aren't representing those values yet? I mean, how will you deal with that? And I said, it doesn't matter, right? We're not another, there's no need to create more standards and certifications. All we care about is that if someone says that they align with and want to work towards this, if they're doing nothing but, but, but have thought about this now as a first step, I, I'm happy that they are, and, and I feel they are willing, they are willing and, 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 uh, and worthy of being a part of a, a broader movement that's, that's trying to do the same. Um, so we've changed a lot in the last few years um, through um, our focus on climate change our focus on equity and our focus on collaboration, on coalition building. You know, we built after we built the future of tourism, we then built, built the Glasgow Declaration. They are linked in many ways, and the Glasgow Declaration continues to grow and bring um, lots of organizations to the table and lots of um, organizations that have a, a, a bigger role to play. Getting Expedia, for example, which in global travel and tourism is such an influential organization, to the table that they came to us and said, "If we're going to join this, what do we do?" And how can we be of most use? And to be able to have that conversation with meaningful organizations who can, if they want, scale change tomorrow um, is a great opportunity for us and, and the work that we're doing to get out of an echo chamber and move into something that is potentially much more meaningful. I'm not going to go into all this examples, but 
just to tell you some of the work we've been doing. We've been um, visit Scotland and Scottish Enterprise um, partner on climate change and tourism, um, helping them to develop their own national strategy. They were the first destination to declare a climate emergency um, and to develop a strategy um, for uh, turning net zero, uh, turning their tourism strategy into a net zero strategy. And they did that with all of their recovery funds from COVID, which I, I find astounding politically that they pulled that off. But they, they were at a point that where they had got everyone to believe that not only was this an imperative, it could be an opportunity. And it's already paying off. They're developing, they're developing trips, labeling them, and, and seeing that they're attracting a slightly different audience, a particularly a younger audience who's interested in Scotland for um, putting its values first. Um, with Expedia, we've developed a partnership where we are going to be training DMOs around the world uh, around climate. We're quite determined for this to be relevant and interesting and not just a, a tick box exercise or something that people are being made to do. Like I feel perhaps sustainability was over, in many ways in, um, over the years. And, and I think um, if where we end up here is, is that there are climate change strategies sitting over here and business as usual strategies over here, then we've actually not done the job. Um, more importantly, it's that people understand and have the, the tools, the knowledge, the inspiration to know how to apply this subject to day-to-day -day thinking. And that could be anything from marketing to destination development to working with media and influencers to think, if I have a goal, how can these people help me to achieve my goal? And I think that lines up more with um, the, what, what DMOs um, potentially are looking for and, and ways that they can be relevant in that conversation. And also, um, the vision there is for them to, to uh, become sort of trainers for local businesses to have the tools that they need to be able to, to bring action to the ground um, and to be a resource for their community and for um, businesses to, to know how to respond to this particular challenge. But I, I was inspired by Scotland from the very beginning because they said, when they stepped back from it, they said, all of this is coming, and our sector, if you look at the readiness to just deal with it, is the readiness is very low. There's no acumen, there's no literacy, like people, so we may not have to develop all the plans for everyone, but we have to give them more tools and more knowledge to be able to to be creative and come up with their own strategies of how this may apply in their own context. And I, I think that's a really nice way to think about it. We've been working in some big um, destinations in the US, um, Tahoe, Lake Tahoe being one of them, and Vail being another. I'm particularly um, fascinated by what's going on in Lake Tahoe because things are a mess there. I mean, you have uh, a situation that's just gotten worse over time, a lot of growth. People are really unhappy. Residents are unhappy. Businesses are unhappy. Vi you know, visitors are increasingly unhappy. It just sort of feels like it's this place that is loved and everyone wants to protect, but that no one really loves what's going on there that much. And you have a very complicated um, governance situation. There are five DMOs, I think six DMOs, just in the Tahoe area. You have two states. You have just tremendous administrative craziness. <laughs> Um, and, and of course, everyone sort of ha with their own plans and their own strategies and not a lot of collaboration. They've come together, I think the total now is 27 different organizations who have funded an, a new effort to look at destination stewardship collaboratively. And that means looking at the issues and the agenda items that sit on top of all of their work um, that they can bring back to their boards or their communities and say, this is what we've agreed to as a collective. What matters here is the health of the lake, for example. The lake came up time and time again that there were no trade-offs that would make um, the health of the lake um, you know, sort of worth sacrificing. And once everyone had agreed to that principle, it became a, a tool for, um, for collective action, for thinking about what are the things that we can do together to achieve that, and what are the ways that we need to work together to mitigate the threats to, that, um, to, that potential, to the potential health of the lake. So that leads us to where we are with 4VI and where we're headed. Um, We've told the story many times, I'm not gonna tell it again, but when I was here that day, when Anthony made the announcement, I had no idea that that was coming, and I was, I was delighted. <laughs> um, mostly because, I, mean, I didn't know the team, I didn't know much about what was going on here, I just was so happy to hear that someone was making a go of something different. Because sitting around destination after destination after destination, hearing the same problems, year after year, over and over again, 
it gets a little maddening. You think, why do we have the same problems everywhere? And, and it's not like people aren't trying new things to try to fix it. And I, you know, and I told Anthony, I think on that day, I said, I think it's important that this story become visible and that the lessons from it become, vis become visible, whatever.